Good morning. I like to cook. Everybody in my family likes to cook. You go into the kitchen at any time, there's something boiling on the stove or baking in the oven, or you might open the refrigerator and look at something marinating. That the kitchen is someplace everybody is all the time. Everybody likes to shop, too. My husband likes to shop for the week. My son likes to shop for a day. So food's coming in all the time. I don't know what people are spending. But one of the things that frustrates me is responsibility. I can go into the kitchen at any time, and there's usually dirty dishes in there, too. And we like gadgets. But I notice that some of those gadgets are sort of collecting dust. And we're not really sure we needed those gadgets. Well, it's the same with time and labor. Time and attendance is an area in the organization that touches every person every day. But it's not owned very well. You yourself, your organization, may be looking at buying new technology. Or you may realize there are some problems in your organization around time and attendance. But I ask you, how many people in here own time and attendance? Raise your hands. That's your area of responsibility. In how many organizations is there no one department where time and attendance is owned? That's part of the problem, is that time and attendance doesn't really have a home or an, a clear owner. And it's suffering for some, from, from fragmented ownership. And we'll talk today about how to overcome that. One of the problems is the term time and attendance. Historically, this has represented time clocks and data collection. But it is so much more than that today. With time and attendance, you're investing in very large systems that integrate with a number of other systems. They integrate with your HR system, your payroll system, maybe your point of sale system or your manufacturing ERP systems. You may also be noticing that there are some problems with your labor spending or productivity or compliance and risk. All those things combined mean that we're managing assets. We're managing people and technology but we're not doing it in a cohesive way. Time and labor, your labor expense, typically represents 30 to 70% of a firm's total cost. That's a number to get excited about. That's a number to want to own. But the problem has been that nobody owns it. Time and attendance is typically very fragmented. If I go into any organization, it's owned by IT, HR, payroll, operations. They all have a say in what's going on in time and attendance. And that fragmented model doesn't inspire collaboration. In fact, there's a lot of competing priorities go along. I'll go into an organization and there'll be a business unit that's crying for customer reports, or the payrolls are not working, or they've got a lot of compliance headaches. But the IT department's over there going, I don't have bandwidth for that. We didn't buy enough servers for that. And these competing priorities mean that important problems are not being resolved in the organization. But there is a solution, and that is the Workforce Management Office. Adopting the model from the shared service model and also from the Project Management Office, the Workforce Management Office is a new business unit that owns time and labor. And it sits equal to all these other stakeholders so that no one has a predominant voice in this area. This model helps the organization consolidate, standardize, and own time and attendance so that it can influence the outcomes. I used to be a payroll supervisor many, many years ago. And in the four short years I was in that role, I watched HR rise up, but payroll stayed down here. And why was that? This is because HR has said for many, many years, look, we're managing big expenses. We're managing benefits and compliance and things like that. But nobody was owning payroll and saying, we influence that. And it's time to kind of step up and recognize that without that, the organization is suffering from the seven deadly sins of fragmented ownership. Now, you didn't know how I was going to transition from time and attendance to the seven deadly sins. But let's take a look there and see how that's impacting the organization. And I want to have some fun with this so that you remember these things and take them back with you. The first one is gluttony. In a system that's designed without intent, there tends to be an appetite for more and more. And sometimes we just don't know when to say no. The evidence is clear, people wanting more reports, when we may have a report that will do. Or they want 
special rules for themselves, or they want more compensation, or they want m something more than they have today. Think of your organization. You, if you're dispersed and you have sites all over the country, how many of your organizations have three or four different time and attendance systems? I've seen large organizations have as many as 15 to 20 different time and labor systems. They own Kronos. They own WorkBrain. They own something from ADP. They grew something in-house over here. That's the way it is because, again, it's fragmented. And people in their own little areas have gotten the opportunity to go, I've got some money. I want something for my group. The next one is lust. Yearning for something you don't have or yearning for more than you need, maybe something that's out of your league. You may want more technology when less will do. Or you may want preferential treatment. So we have to get our arms around those kinds of things and put in a model that will take care of that. The Workforce Management Office balances these kinds of requests and aligns them with the actual functionality requests with the real requirements. Do you really need that special pay rule? I know your friends over at XYZ or this place that you came from, they had it, but that's not our company. So we have to make sure that the requests and the demands put on this area are reasonable and aligned with organizational goals. The next one is greed. And this is a favorite topic of mine. I talk about a concept called payroll leakage. Payroll leakage is the unintended and unexpected overspending on payroll, on time and labor. Anywhere from a half to two and a half percent of your total labor expense is recoverable payroll leakage and no one's going after it. How many in here have metrics for payroll leakage? Nobody. It's gaming and gifting. It's employees abusing the rounding rules. Is anybody familiar with rounding time to the 15 minute increment? And if you clock right at 808, you can inflate your pay 15 minutes. Do that four times a day and that's an hour of inflated pay. Cancel my meals, work through my break. That's a half hour done over and over and over. Our firm is going in and evaluating companies and looking at their payroll leakage and putting it in business intelligence and diagnostic tools. And we can confirm and show them where that payroll leakage is. And why does it exist? Because nobody owns it. Because it's managed in a very fragmented, dispersed way. We're going, this supervisor is responsible for this kind of stuff. That manager over there, he's supposed to be watching this. But at the local level, it's nickels and dimes. It doesn't add up. It's not until you aggregate it for the whole organization that you see that all these things add up to millions of dollars and nobody's looking at it. The Workforce Management Office puts in place design with intent, a lean methodology to time and labor, going and saying, if this is 30 to 70 percent of my total budget for the organization, I should have a strategy. Look what we did for supply chain management. 30 years ago, that didn't exist. And you had individual departments buying their paper and this guy over there buying that. And somebody said at some point, well, he's a thrifty shopper, but boy, he spins like the dickens. The same thing goes on with supervisors. Some are enforcing the rules and some are not. Some are gifted. We call it gifting. And that is managers taking advantage of the system and they're using it to reward and incentivize employees to manage their department. And we're not doing anything about it. Sloth. Sometimes it's not what you see, but what you don't see in a system. And in these cases, we install the systems, and then, boy, we're done. We walk away. We stop auditing. We maybe didn't do a great job of documentation, and, oh, the project's over. I don't have any time now for documentation. We look at things like um, nobody's signing off. Gosh, we turned on that feature, but nobody's using it. Well, who's going to clamp down on that? Who's going to enforce that policy and procedure? Again, this fragmented model means that these things that we needed to do to get the return on investment out of our technologies and systems aren't being done. The next one is wrath. Eventually, somebody's going to get mad. They're going to file a grievance, a lawsuit. And time and attendance is ripe for this kind of abuse. One of the things I do is I'm an expert legal witness, and I defend employers against class action lawsuits around their use of systems like Kronos. And believe you me, they are going after employers. Anybody who's been laid off is looking for money and work. The lawyers are out there. And we have to design defensibly. But the poor payroll people, they may have talked to the vendor and said, there's a great feature called attestation. 
But guess what? They don't have any budget. And they go to the other, you know, and, and IT says, we're too busy. We can't implement anything new. And the operations people say, I've never heard of that. We're not going to use that. So these good ideas never surface to the top because nobody owns time and attendance. Envy, the Me Too mentality. This is where people feel a sense of entitlement. Well, my husband works for a, a union, and they get paid shift premium on their holidays. I want shift premium on my holidays. I want it on my time off. There's all kinds of opportunities. When we do our leakage assessments, we go in and find these policies that have manifested over time into in, in, engorged entitlements. The Workforce Management Office neutralizes that sense of entitlement and says, I'm up here, we treat all departments fairly. It also negotiates the change, because to implement this model, it is going to mean some change. There are going to be some departments that their power that they're wielding today, the, the lack of enforcement, the informality may change. The last one is pride. So you've heard this, right? I, my department's not going to do that. We don't need this new scheduling system. I've got a system that works just fine. Well, how am I going to implement the benefits of these new technologies? How am I going to get my arms around and see, are you really scheduling really well? How does your demand meet the way that you've um, supplied labor in the workforce? There's scheduling is a whole area in and of itself that we don't teach people how to schedule. When you went to business school, did anybody teach you how to schedule? When you promote people into supervisory roles, do you teach them how to schedule? So the Workforce Management Office broadcasts our policies. It puts in place education programs. And it essentially makes sure that these seven deadly sins don't overtake the organization. So if you think this is a good idea, and it, and it is. This isn't just me talking. If you look out there, there are now people with the title of Director of Workforce Management. Um, there should be in your organization somebody who owns this. So how do you put that together? Well, of course, you're going to start gathering the metrics, building the business case. But essentially, there's three steps. Consolidate. If your organization has multiple time and labor systems, consolidate them into one. If you've got five or six different people who own this area, consolidate that into one role that ultimately is, is responsible. Make the definition of success for that individual and that department all around time and labor outcomes. Cost, risk, productivity. Those should be the things that work time and labor is managed against. They're all financial. They're all important to the success of the organization. Make sure you don't have redundancies and workarounds, and you don't have too many gaps going on. The next one, standardization. For time and labor management, that means instead of driving with an eight-lane highway, change your organization to have a two-lane highway, and not so many on and off ramps. Because what we do is we just build on and pile on. One of the things about HR people is they never met a policy with an expiration date. Things come up, and we just pile it on. There's just more and more. I will go into organizations, and they'll have 500 pay codes. They'll have 2,000 pay rules in their system. Be and they've been around for years. Look at on-call pay. It used to be called beeper pay. Anybody familiar with that? That's, that used to be because you used to have to sit at home and literally wait by the phone. Then it went to beeper pay, and that was slight. Then you had to run to a phone somewhere. And my beeper's going off, but I can't call anybody. I'm dating myself, right? Um, now we're still paying that stuff. Why are we still paying on-call pay? You can be out and about doing anything you please. And you've got your cell phone right there. You can go right into work. But we still pay a, tons of money in on-call pay. So standardizing. And sometimes we still pay it in one department, but this department got rid of it a long time ago. That stuff breeds contempt. And to the speakers before me, does not make you an employer of choice? Problems in your time and attendance system will manifest themselves into frustrations in the workforce, grievances not the great place to work. And finally, ownership. One vision, one voice, one set of priorities. Not a special set of priorities for individual departments or guys who've been around forever or know the CEO, but one consolidated standard set of priorities. This also makes it easier to um, manage your assets, your people and your technology. 
but it makes them accountable to that. Uh, gentlemen in the back, we were talking about rewards and performance. These kinds of things, the things that happen in time and attendance, you can easily track them. They all have start and stop times, and they all relate directly to pay. You can create performance metrics that go into your annual review. How many punch gamings did you allow in your department last year? How many canceled meals in your department? Hey, there's a dollar figure. So that's a, an important strategic performance evaluation component. So again, back to the workforce management office. It's a totally different paradigm for organizations. It may, you may feel like it takes something away from your organization, but you definitely will benefit from taking this more strategic and less transactional. It's not about time clock punches anymore. If you're interested in learning more, there are professionals who are seeking education and certification. And there's a representative in the back from the Association for Workforce Asset Management. This association is a professional organization that is creating education in time and attendance, has never existed before. And Wiley Publishing is interested in embarking on college courses, imagine that, in time and attendance. Because it's a rec now it's a recognized specialty in the organization. So my question to you is, are you ready to create a WMO under the shared service model in your organization? Thank you.